I'll be concerned with what my friends think of me. I'll be concerned with what my friends think of me. I'll need you to teach me that I only need God's approval. That I only need God's approval. I want what I want when I want it. I'll want what I want when I want it. I'll need you to teach me to be a servant so I can love others. So I can love others. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll think I'm a lot smarter than I actually am. I'll need you to show me how to learn from God's wisdom. I'll act like I don't have any problem. I'll need you to show me how to share my struggles with others. I'll tend to think about myself before others. I'll need you to teach me that the last will become first. The last will become first. The last will become first. I'll have many reasons to hold grudges. I'll have many reasons to hold grudges. I'll need you to model forgiveness so I can learn to show grace. So I can learn to show grace. I want to have a lot of money so I can buy what I want. I'll need you to teach me that my things belong to God. That my things belong to God. I'll struggle with my looks and appearance. I'll need you to remind me that God wonderfully made me. I'll need you, Mom. I'll need you, Mom. I'll need you, Mom. To point me toward Christ. When no one else will. Amen. Praise the Lord. Thank you, mamas. We thought two videos wasn't too much. I think everybody in here has a mama, don't they? Oh, I was just checking. I didn't know. The AI stuff, the way it's happening, you never know. I, I didn't think we had any robots among us, but I think we've all got mamas. So uh, if you have your Bibles with you, turn with me to Joshua. Joshua chapter 2, verse uh, 1 through 21 is the extended reading, but I'm going to reduce it because some of you have got attention spans like mine. And uh, it takes it, so I'm going to read 1 through 11, then 16 through 22. And uh, if I was going to title this message before we read today, while you're turning there, Joshua chapter 2, uh, verse 1 through 21, uh, I would title this message, What the Thread Said. What the Thread Said. You know, if you, if you know your Bible, we're going to be talking about Rahab. I figured a Mother's Day uh, would be a time to talk about a mama uh, in the story and, and somebody that's lineage. Actually, Rahab's lineage was connected to Christ, so we know that in her loins uh, or, or, or that she was uh, then direct lineage of Christ, believe it or not, through, through uh, her father or through Jesus' father, if you will. So uh, Joshua chapter 2, verse 1 uh, we will begin our reading. What the thread said, it spoke highly of the thread that she put around her window seal. And it says this, And Joshua the son of Nun sent out of Shittim two men to spy secretly, saying, Go view the land, even Jericho. And they went, and they came into the harlot's house. They came into a harlot's house. I don't know if you caught that. Named Rahab and lodged there. And it was told the king of Jericho, saying, Behold, there came men hither tonight of the children of Israel to search out the country. And the king Jericho sent unto Rahab, saying, Bring forth the men that they are come to thee, which are entered into thine house, for thy they come to search out the country. And then verse 4 says this, And the women took two men and hid them and said, Thus there came men unto me, but wist I not whence there were. How do you like the King James? I'm reading out of that today. Whence they were. And it came to pass about time of shutting the gate, when it was dark, that the men went out. Whether the men went out, I would not. Pursue after them quickly, for ye shall overtake them. In other words, get out of here quick or else you're going to get killed. But she had brought them up to the roof of the house and hid them with the stalks of the flax which she had laid in order, of order upon the roof. And verse 7, excuse me, uh, yeah, verse 7 says this, And the men pursued after them the way to the Jordan of the fords, and as soon as they were pursued after, they were gone out, they shut the gate, and before they were laid down, she came up unto them on the roof. And here's what Rahab said unto the men. I know that the Lord hath given you the land, and that your terror is fallen upon us, and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you. For we have heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea, for you were when they come out of Egypt, and what you did unto the two kings of the Amorites, that they were on the other side of the Jordan, Shihon, Og, whom you utterly destroyed. And as soon as we heard these things, our hearts did melt. Neither did they remain any more courage in any man because of you. For the Lord your God, he is God in heaven above and on earth beneath. And I'm going to jump down to 16. I know it's a lot of reading, but I want to cover the story. And she said unto them, Get ye to the mountain, lest your pursuers meet you, and hide yourself there three days until the pursuers be returned, and afterward 
may you go your way. And the men said unto her, We will be blameless of this thine oath, which thou hast made to us to swear. And look at verse 18. It's a key verse. If you have a key word study Bible, it'll have a key besides it. Behold, when we come into the land, thou shalt bind this scarlet thread on the window, which thou didst let us down by, and thou shalt bring thy father, thy mother, thy brethren, and the father's house, behold, home unto thee. And it shall be that whosoever shall go out of the doors of the house under the street, his blood shall be upon his head. And when we and we will be guiltless, and whosoever shall be with thee in thine house, his, should, his blood shall be on our head, if any hand be upon him. And just two more verses here, a couple more verses. And if thou utter this business, then we will be quiet, and of thine oath which thou hast made us to swear. And she said, According unto your words, so be it. And she sent them away, and they departed, and she bound a scarlet line in the window. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you today that, God, the, the spirit, I know it rained. And, God, I know it's been a, a week, a difficult week for many, God, and the move and the stressors of life and graduations. But, God, I thank you, God, that in the midst of all the turmoil, in the midst of all of life, God, you're still there. God, there's still a remnant, God, that hangs on. And, God, we worship you in spirit and in truth. And I pray today. God, I, I prayed this morning, I pray today that one person maybe would come forward this morning, and God, that they would give their life to you, and God, I'm excited about that, and God, I pray that you be at the remainder of this service, be with the altar service, and the invitation, let your anointing be thick in this place today, in Jesus' name we pray, amen. As I begin to look at the scripture, uh, first of all, uh, I, I, I don't want to overstate the obvious, but I do think it does start, I've said this before, if you know, I, I said that it kind of starts like a bad joke, right? Like Rahab the harlot had two guys that came into her house. And like, I'm not sure that that's a great Bible story, but the Bible's full of good stories that we can relate to. And so first of all, I want to point out in this scripture, uh, we all know what happened. We know that the children of Israel, uh, if you've been in the chronological Bible reading at all, I think there's four of us yet doing it, four of my a few friends that are doing that. But if you follow through a chronological Bible reading program, most of them are, have been through this part of the story since we're coming up on halfway through the year, this part of the Bible. But you know that the children of Israel now, they had, they're crossing into the promised land. They go across the Jordan, and as they cross into the Jordan, the first town that they got overcome is, is, is now Jericho. And so Jericho, they had never crossed into it. So here Rahab is in Jericho, and Jericho's, uh, you know, a huge city, but it's a Canaanite city. In other words, they didn't know God at all. And so first of all, I want to say this, Rahab was a harlot, but when I say that, uh, let me go ahead and put that in, in Wichita terms. Rah, rah, you know, I got to get the cookies down on the bottom shelf for me. But, but in, in Wichita terms, she was an escort. <laughs> So I don't know if you knew that or not, but that, but that, but that she was an escort. Now I'm not sure exactly what she did, but I think you can probably figure this out on a, on a, even a Sunday with on Mother's Day that she wasn't a real good woman. But in those day and age, in in this city, it wasn't like she was worse than anybody else. As a matter of fact, in this city of Jericho, they actually used uh, uh, they used harlots and they used prostitutes in their worship. They actually would bring them into the church, what they would call the church. And they would bring them in, and they would actually worship. And when they worshiped, they would bring them, and they would have them do certain acts, if you will. And now, that may strike you today, but I don't think sometimes we're too far from the modern-day church. Sometimes what we call church isn't church. Hmm. Thank you for all three of you that agree with me. But I think, I'm not saying, hey, listen, I love to have a good time. Actually, you know, my kids, they really, they really push me sometimes to play games and things. Joshua can tell you up here on the front, I wasn't a big game guy. But I'm learning the older I get, the, uh, the more fun I do like to have. I like to have, I'm not against going to different things. And man, some of these, these, some of these Christian concerts you go to, man, you, the first one I went to, it freaked me out. I mean, I went to like Toby Mac. I mean, cutting edge stuff back then, you know. This tells my age. I mean, Toby Mac. And man, they was up there jamming around and smoking lights and flipping around. And, man, they, and I'm not against doing that having fun. There's nothing wrong with having fun. But I still think there's a place in church that we need to be, not that we need to be somber or overly serious, but there's a place that we need to know when we walk into the house of God, we're in the house of God. We need to know that there's a difference of what that is. And I'm not going to go back on a bunch of rules and regulations and things that I believe in. That's not, that's not the point of this message. But the point is Rahab was just following those who were around her. 
And I think it's an important thing that we can talk about. You will follow those that are around you. If you show me your friends, I'll show you your future. You'll follow those around you. That's why we have guys in here in recovery. Some of them's like right up here up front. So I'll talk about them a little bit because they're here. They've got to learn to find new friends and new places and new people. And I know it's hard because I got friends that I've been knowing a long time. Matter of fact, more than most people in this church, I have friends. But I got to be careful that I don't spend too much time around them. And Rahab was just a product of her environment. She was just a product. She she had an inn, so she had a place that people would stay. So Rahab, don't look look down on her too far because everyone's got a little bit of Rahab in us. Oh, there's 10 of you that agree with me. I tell you this right now. I tell, I tell, I'll, I'll tell you, I, I, was, I was in the oil field long enough, I think 26 years. I, every once in a while, the oil field hand comes out in me. I don't mean for him to. It's not on purpose. But God, I know God's big enough, but sometimes I slip up. And sometimes I, 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 I get a little bit short. I don't mean to. I'm not trying to. And I'm just telling you. But every once in a while, you could call it, I call it the Saul in us. But maybe you ladies could call it the Rahab in you. That you just get it. Now, none of you mothers today have ever gotten testy. But I know a few that have gotten testy. Listen. My mama's hand was 20 foot long. Is mama here? There she is, yeah. She could slap you from three cars in front of you. You might be in the neighbor's car, but mama could slap through three windshields. I'm telling you. Whap. I mean, it was like one of them sticky hands, you know. Well, pow. They get, I mean, it would slay. She would slap. But it's as a matter of fact, I'll tell you this. I needed, obviously, I needed more whippings than I ever got. But Rahab, she was, she, was quite the, the, she was quite the wild woman. She, I mean, hey, let's just go ahead and say it. She was a hippie. Can we put it in modern day terms? And, and, but, but she was actually respectable enough. She'd had things together. She'd had an end. So when people came, she would be in her house and she would actually uh, rent them a room. And that was common in those days. You remember when Jesus was born that there was no room for him in the inn. And that was a similar type of inn. But also she had another, another hobby. So they called her a harlot. But number one, she was a harlot. She was a wild woman. But then number, th- number two, this important is she lived in fear. She lived in fear. The people of Jericho, here's what, the, here, I never got this about the scripture before. Here's what the scripture said. The scripture said that we heard what you did. I think you have it if you'll pull that up. I think our, our monitor in the back's a little bit slower than the ones in front. I think you have that. And she said unto the men, I know that the Lord hath given you the land and that your terror is falling upon us and that all the inhabitants of the land faint because of you, for we have heard. Let me go ahead and tell you something. The people that you witness to in your life, your kids, your grandkids, it might be your mama, I don't know your daddy, you trust me on this. They're watching what you do. They're seeing what's going on in your life. They may not be happy with it. They may not be overjoyous with it, but people are watching how you live your life. And it says this, for we have heard, she's talking about Jericho. This is Rahab speaking. We've heard how the Lord dried up the water of the Red Sea for you. And when you came out of Egypt and what ye did unto the two kings of the Amorites that were on the other side of the Jordan, Shihon and Og, whom you utterly destroyed. She says, we've heard how you dried up the water. Before they crossed into the promised land, that was 40 years before this. Rahab had been there for 40 years, and the Bible says that their hearts were melted with fear. Do you want to know what's wrong with America today? Well, I I think it would take a doctor, uh, and I don't have a doctorate, but if I was going to give it a diagnosis, America has been scared to death for most of its life. Oh, you don't believe me. Let me rewind back to 2020. Some of you know what I'm talking about. I was listening for people coughing too. I'm not going to lie. <laughs> I like, is that a cough? COVID-19, you know. I'm telling you. What was that? So, I mean, I, mean, I, I, I was hard. Listen, I used it. Someone said, you got to use hand sanitizer more. I said, I can't. They said, what do you mean? I said, I already use it all the time. Before COVID, I was, I was washing. That's just how I am. I'm a, I'm a washer guy. But I'm telling you, it scared some people to death. And I mean, it showed us, I remember them saying, you're going to be shut down for a while, then two weeks, and it was six months. And listen, I mean this. This was a real thing. It affected our culture. It affected me, and I had to pray through some of that stuff. Not that I was locked down in my home or anything, but it it showed me how America, man, just one little virus. I know it was a big virus. I know people died. I know people that died. 
And listen, I said this Wednesday night. I don't, on that side of that, I'm not, you're not going to hear me get political on this. I'm going to tell you this right now. I'm not talking about whether you get the vaccine or whether you don't. That's irrelevant to me, and I don't care. Let me go ahead and just back that up. I mean that. That's your health care. You do what you want to do with that. I mean that. But I will say this. It affected some people. Vaccine or no vaccine, it affected them, and it made them fearful, and they were scared because you know what? Because all of a sudden they realized that death could stare them in the face one day. And all that the devil meant for bad in that, I believe that God's going to turn around for good because we're going to realize that we are not immortal, that we are mortal people. And it ought to remind us, listen, we're not guaranteed to tomorrow. We're not guaranteed today. We are to be living our lives not in fear, but by faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. They had seen what God had done in their life. They had seen what had happened to Rahab. There was Rahab and Jericho had seen what happened. They said, man, we heard what happened to you 40 years ago. Let me tell you this right now. It's never too late to surrender your life to God. Rahab wasn't too far gone. Rahab hadn't had too many men. Rahab hadn't been too immoral. God looked down on her because of these spies, and God looked down on her and said, I want to rescue your life from this fear, from this bondage. What do you think you'll do if you run out of money and you can't feed your children? I think harlotism probably would be light compared to what some of us would do. Reminds me of a story in the scripture when there were two children and, and, and there, there was a child and they boiled the child and, and they were so hungry that they boiled the child and they ate the child. I mean, and you're in famine and you're in fear. When you're in fear, it'll make you do things you normally wouldn't do. Listen, when I'm scared, I can run faster. <laughs> Remember when you was a little kid, Tim? You get the new shoes. That's four lights on shoes, man. That was way later. That's like my kids, right? I get new shoes. I was like, man, I can run faster, you know. I've got shoes that go faster. They're called fear shoes. Man, I'm telling you, I can't, some of you, I watched you. Out the, I, we looked out the window, and I saw some of you coming out of your car. You was moving pretty quick out in cars. <laughs> I want to tell you this, by the way. We're never against if you have to, and it's raining really bad. You can pull underneath the back. That's okay. We'll let, try to let you in back there. Beat on the door. Someone will let you in. But Rahab lived in fear, and, and that's not a way to live. You know, there, there's something that happens in, in, the, in a Christian's life when they finally say, you know what, devil, you can threaten me, you can accuse me, because, and by the way, I don't really respond to that in my mind. I know the Bible says bring every thought into the captivity of Christ, that there is a solace that I have that I know the devil can't take my soul, he can't take my life. If my life goes, it's been good to live in the house of the Lord, it's been good to serve the God that I've served. This journey's been a good journey. I refuse to live in fear. I refuse to worry about what someone's going to do to me. Amen. I'm not going to live in fear. And I think people do live in fear and, and, and they're scared of this and they're scared of that and, and they protect this. And I'm not saying that we shouldn't have security. We have security here at the church to protect your children. We have a kid check process to make that safe for them. But I'm not going to live in fear because if you ever get in fear, then you've walked away from faith. And I'm telling you, Rahab was in a difficult, but, I, but I, first of all, I noticed that she was a harlot. Second of all, I noticed that she lived in fear. But third of all, I noticed that there was provision. <laughs> Man, there is provision. I, I used to, let me say this when we're talking about fear. I made fun of anxiety for years. Forgive me. Because one day it knocked on my door. <laughs> it knocked on my door and said, and I thought, what's happening? Something's wrong. I'm having a heart attack. I'm not making light of this, but I can laugh at me. Hey, you learn to laugh at you. I thought, I'm dying today. That's it. I'm saved. I'm a Christian. I know where I'm going. But I thought there's a few more things I wanted to do. I had anxiety, and the more I thought about it, the worse it got. It got tighter. It got tighter. And boy, I'm telling you, this is a good first service, and I'm giving you all my faults. But that's okay. I learned this. If you give people your faults, they know that you love them, and they know that you're real. But boy, I started feeling it tighter and tighter. And I thought, there's something wrong. And I thought, well, that, that's it. It's in my throat. Well, this could be it. It could be locked jaw. I don't know. <laughs> it's serious. You know, I always heard if you step on a nail, locked jaw, you can't breathe next thing. You know, I don't know if that's even a thing, but that's when I was a kid. That's why you got tetanus shots. I think it was a lie. But anyway, I know what it was. Locked jaw. Something's happening. I'm starting to lock up in my chest, my neck, everything's getting tight. I went to the doctor and I laid down there. And, you know, you know when you get like that, you get compliable. <laughs> you say, yes, ma'am, what do I need to do? Anything I need to do. I'll do anything I need to do. And Dr. Q, she laid me down there in Wellington. Boy, she put those things all over me. She does an EKG on me. And I'm watching that, and I'm like, bloop, bloop. I'm like, oh, that's not good. That can't be good. They're going, bloop, bloop. And then there's bloop, bloop. I'm like, oh, that's not good. Something's wrong. And she walked back in, and when she walked back into the place, she said, uh, Jason, she said, I think you're going to be okay. I said, I'm going to be okay. No surgery. No. Need, no. <laughs> she said, actually, the problem is, is you need to take an antacid because you have heartburn. 
I'm like, are you serious? I was planning my funeral, man. <laughs> I, I was scared to death. But I'm telling you, when you start having stuff happen to you, some of you shouldn't watch TV after 10 o'clock, you know, them ads that come on there. You diagnose yourself, and don't you search Google. But even if we got, I got some goofy things about me. Everybody here that serves here knows I'm goofy about some things. We all, hey, y'all goofy too. That's why y'all's here. We're goofy together. But then I begin to think of all that she was and all that the society said she wasn't. That she, first of all, was a harlot. She, second of all, was in fear. But third of all, there's a provision. And man, whatever happens in our life, God is the provider. See, that's what I couldn't figure out when I was in the world. I, I mean, I had a lot of friends. Actually, I had a lot of associates. I had a few friends. But man, I noticed one thing. If I had money in my pocket, I had a lot of friends. When I was broke, the CIA couldn't find them. Amen? <laughs> But I'm telling you, I, but God is provided in the midst of my mess. God found me. Yeah. Yeah. The Bible says that whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It doesn't say some that do and some that don't. It's whosoever. I believe that's a universal call. I don't believe in the universal church. That's a whole other message. But I do believe in the universal call. And I do believe that God wants to save every person from fear, from harlotism, from anger, from d depression. I believe he wants to save you. I'm not against getting help from professionals. I just told you I go to doctors and I have to take pills myself. I got to take sugar diabetes pills, and I don't like that. But I'm telling you, our God is able to rescue us out of that fear. He's able to provide for our fear. He, he gives us all things that pertain to life and godliness. And I believe, but here, here's, what, here's the picture I got. And, and man, I'm, I'm, I'm getting closer, but I, there, there was provision. There was provision. And as I begin to think about, here's Rahab. She's up there in her window, and she's up there. And I'm, I'm, I probably won't blow this horn. If you really agitated me enough, I might. But I'm going to save it. I did, did that on a Wednesday night. But, uh, but, but, I, but I mean this is, is what they did, the children of Israel. Let me get you back in the Bible story. The children of Israel, when they crossed into the promised land, here they were, they were going to march around the walls of Jericho. Well, she didn't know this at the time, but they said to Rahab, they said, Rahab, here's all you need to do. She said, we want you to take the rope that you let us down with out of the window, and we want you to wrap that around the window. And when we see you put that around the window, we'll know that it's your house, so we won't destroy you. Now, I don't know about you, but, but, there, that, but, that, but that's pretty serious. I mean, I mean when, when someone says, don't leave your house... That, that's, that's easy for me for one day. That's easy for me if I'm sick. But that's, in other words, stay in your house. And here's one of the things they said. They said, they said what you need to do is get your family all in the house. And by the way, I'm all for all church activities, but you make sure when you're in a church activity, you go ahead and bring your family with you. That's right. That's right. Don't ground your kids from youth group. Right. I mean that. Bring them to youth group. Now, don't use it as punishment or else we'll have to talk to Keaton. If it's a punishment, it's really not working like it's supposed to. But I will tell you this, is that is what they were doing is, is, they said, you need to bring them all into your house, and you need to make sure no one leaves your house. And if you do leave your house, or if your family, then your blood is on your hand. You know what? That's, that's what's hard for me is, I, I, I always say this, I want everybody in Wichita to come to Evidence Church. Amen. We'll have more services. I don't know what we'll do. We still own another church. Maybe we'll put a screen up. I don't know. No, we won't do that. Uh, this is, we, we, we've been doing what we can do. But I will say this, I know it's not everybody's church. I recognize that. I'm not everybody's pastor. But find yourself a church that you believe in. Find yourself a church that you'll stay inside the church. Man, I hear things happen to people and tragedies in their life, and I'm like, I wonder where they went. Are they going over here? Are they going over there? They went over here because they've tried. There's nothing wrong with trying churches. You'll know when you're home by the time you leave. I always tell people, give us a second chance. This is our, this is our first service. So give us a second chance. We're still, getting, we're still new to this building and, and everything. But I mean this. When they were there, they had said, look, we're going to be coming over here. You leave the rope. And I begin to think about the rope. I almost got a rope, but I didn't get a rope. I was a bit busy last night working late. But I got to thinking, do you know how uncommon that is? How about you, Edna? I'll tell you what. Do you have a rope at your house that's about 30 foot long that you could let me out of a window with? Yes. You do? I do. Praise the Lord, you ruined my message. Amen. <laughs> no, you're fine. I tell you what, I got a log chain that would hold a Dodge truck that you could stretch out of. How's that, Edna? <laughs> I mean, it's a big log chain. But I'm saying it's not probably that common in the Bible, Bible days. I mean, I mean, would she get her carriage stuck and just had a rope around, a tow rope, you know? 
But she had a rope in her house, and he said, use the same rope that you let us down with. And by the way, it wasn't just any rope, but it was a crimson rope, which broke of the blood of Jesus. And if you ever to hold on to any rope, I tell people this all the time, when you're going through crisis in your life, the first thing you need to know is that you need to have a small group. You need to have a group of people that you pray for. That don't mean it has to be in this church. It could be at the coffee shop. You need to have a small group. You need to know God in Sunday services, find freedom in context of a small group. And then after you know God, find freedom, discover your purpose in our growth track, and then make a difference through serving. I believe it's the way you need to do it. But here's what I'm saying. You need to have a rope that, that you connect to when things don't go right. You need a rope that you connect to because I want you in my room so you can celebrate when you go through something good as well. Amen. Because your joy helps other people. And when she threw, whenever she had this rope, it was a crimson rope, and, and the church is a picture of the crimson rope. But you also need a rope. I believe in this. You can shout me down. It'll ruin my message. That'll be okay. Wouldn't be the first time. I believe every... No, she didn't do anything. But, but at the same time, I believe that people need a counselor in their life. And I'm not everybody's counselors. I don't even do a lot of it. But I believe at times in our life, it's okay to have a counselor. That's another rope. I believe your spouse can be another rope. I believe your mama, your children, they can be another rope. But what you'll realize is, is every relationship that's any good in your life, God has placed them there for such a time as this. They are a part of that crimson rope, if you will. But, but, if, but you can have all the support and all the help you want, but you must learn to know Jesus Christ as your personal Savior except the one that died for you. I'll do a lot of things for you, but I can't ever say that I'd for sure die for you. But you need to accept that one, and when you're engrafted into that relationship and you use, you use God's system in the way of the local church and ways of small groups, there's something that happens in our life to where no fear can really shake us anymore. I didn't say we wouldn't have one sleepless night, but praise God, I don't have two anymore. But here's what happened to Rahab. They said, go inside your house, put it around the outside, and they said, leave that hanging out when they come. So for seven days, do I got some here, right there? You three, you guys are my army. Get up. And I'm going to get this thing closed down. You guys are my army, all four of you. Get up. All right? Watch that drink. Here's what I want you to do. Mark around, march around the center, that center aisle right there. Follow this guy. He won't lead your own. Follow this way. Go marching. So here's Rahab. <laughs> and I also wondered, I wonder if she ever led anybody else down by that rope. I wonder if there was ever any men in her life that she wasn't proud that was in her house and she had to let them down to that rope. See, God uses all kinds of ropes. We think God only uses the good things. But God uses the bad. <laughs> Behold, old things are passed away. All things become new. He'll work all things out for your good for those who love God called according to his purpose. So they marched around the city one time. So here's Rahab. She's looking out the window. Sometimes we're looking out the window of life. And it's all in perspective. Is God in it? Do we have a red rope around it? Go ahead. Go again. Only seven times. You can march faster if you want. So here she is. She's looking down. And it wasn't just four people. So they had their ark of the testimony. They had their trumpet. Because they knew when they marched around seven times, then they were going to have to take the horn and they were going to have to blow the horn. And when they blew the horn, then the Bible says that all the walls of Jericho fell down to the bottom. And so she's watching and she's going. Can you imagine her saying... Is the rope bright enough? Is the rope? Well, I assure you the blood of Jesus is bright enough to cover every one of your sins. Is the rope long enough? One more time and I'll let you go. That'll be three. Three's a good number. The spies hid for three days, so I'll let you off on that. And then they went on. And then they marched for seven times. We'll see how fast they go. We'll make, the, make the decision then. But then is it long enough? Man, I'll tell you what. I believe that God's been saving souls and helping families for thousands and thousands of years. When I look back on the life of Abraham, when I look back on the life of David, when I look back on the life of Boaz, when I look back on the life which is a direct, direct lineage of Rahab, when I look back, I see he's been helping people for thousands of years. The rope is long enough. Then I wonder if she thought, is the rope strong enough? Listen, our God is a God of strength. Our God is a God of power. Good job, good job, good job, good job. And then when they got done, you can sit down. You're doing good. When they got done, they were to blow the trumpet. And here, here's the part that got me. The whole time she's looking, see, she used to look through life differently. That's how you know you're a child of God. When you look through life one way, and then all of a sudden you look through life a different. The things you used to love, you begin to hate, and the things that you hated, you begin to love. I couldn't stand churches before I got right with God. 
I couldn't stand church people. I'm sorry, but I couldn't stand you. But I'm telling you, when I look through life differently, now when I see that prostitute, when I see that homeless man, when I see Rahab, I think, oh, you need Jesus in your life. I think, oh, you just need a touch. When I see someone mad, I saw someone at Sam's the other day right down here. I'm telling you, I almost invited him to church, but I, he kind of scared me a little. <laughs> he grabs a slams the water, slams the water. Now. He goes, babe, look out. There's people behind you. He said, I don't care. I got to go. And she said, you want me to pull the cart? And she says, I'll pull the cart. You'll run someone over. <laughs> he was fired up. I thought, well, he needs the rope. He just needs Jesus. Man, I used to have thoughts towards people, and I'd think, I can't believe how they are. I can't believe how all I think now is they just need more Jesus. By the way, when something happens in my life and I'm not perfect, I hope that you'd say, you know, he just needs a little more Jesus. Pray for the pastor, because he needs Jesus too. And then all of a sudden, when they blew the horn, they finally blew the horn, and when they blew the horn, the, the wall fell. And I mean, that's when action happens. And they had to go through the city, and they annihilated him. Here's Rahab. She's watching him going, I hope they see me. I wonder if she tried to add any thread or buy a bigger rope. I wonder if they see me. And she's looking out the window going, please don't destroy my family. Please don't destroy my baby. That's why I believe people need church. Man, I know we're at different places, you know. Some people are delivered immediately. Me, myself, saved at 29 years old. I was delivered more slowly. I, I quit the old lifestyle, but there were things that still drug on to me. I said the old oil field hand likes to creep out sometimes. <laughs> But I'll tell you what, I'm not the guy that I used to be. One of my little boys, Jace Riley, they just had a baby there at home. And they just had a baby. And he said, I would never forget, it was a month after I got saved. We were sitting around listening to Christian music with candles lit. And you know something had happened to me. And I'll never forget, he said, Dad. I said, what, son? He said, you've changed. You've changed. Now, I didn't ever do everything perfect, Joshua. I'll never claim to be perfect. I'll never stand in front of you and say that. But I'll tell you this. They knew that Daddy wouldn't be down at the, lower, the tavern. They knew that Daddy wasn't going to be in the paper because of a fist fight. They knew things were different. And I'm, I know there's different testimonies. You know what I told someone the other day? They said, I don't think I have a testimony because I've lived a good life. I said, that's the greatest testimony ever. That's the greatest testimony to have. But we can still work on being more like Jesus. And then finally the walls fell. My question you hear today is, God's made the provision. But unless you take the rope and you place it on the window seal, I put a picture around it. I don't know. I know it was on it. Unless you put that rope there and say, I believe that Jesus Christ is enough for me and he's enough for my family. Unless you accept that by faith, then there'll be destruction that will come. You say, well, it's not an easy life being a Christian. I'll tell you this right now. The Bible says the sufferings of this present time are not the worthy to be compared to the glory that shall be revealed in us. We may suffer, but we don't suffer like others do. We may grieve, but we don't grieve like others do. I grieve because there's a hope. I know that this life is such a small part of an eternity. You could wrap a thread around here 10 million times. It wouldn't be an eternity. And our life literally is that much of it. It's nothing. My question for you today is where have you placed your faith? <clears throat> have you asked God to come into your life to receive him and to turn away from your sin? Every head bowed, every eye closed, I want to ask you this. As the worship team begins to come, I want to ask you, maybe somebody here would, today would say, you know, today's the time for me. On this Mother's Day, May the 14th, 2023, I want to make a decision to serve God. I don't want the judgment to fall on my house, on my soul, and I want to be an example to my family. Maybe somebody here would slip up their hand and say, Preacher, pray for me. I need your prayers. Slip up your hand and write back down, Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. There's three there. There's another one. Four. Is there more? Is there more that would say, Preacher, pray for me. I need your prayers. I, I want to make things right today. Amen. Thank you for that hand. Who else? There's another one and another one. Six, seven. Who else would say today's the day for me? I, I, need to, I need to make some things right. Slip up your hand and write back down. I'll pray for you. I won't come to you. I won't embarrass you. I don't do that. But who would slip up their hand and say, I want to be a part of that prayer? Maybe somebody here would say, you know, I'm a Christian, but I'm not where I need to be. I've, I've not got my family, and I've not been doing what I need to do. I'm not doing my part. I need to get more serious with God and, and make church attendance a, a, a faithful thing and a weekly thing, not just a monthly thing. Maybe you'd slip up your hand and say, I need to do better in my life. Pray for me, preacher. Thank you. Thank you, several of them.
you raise your hand, even if you didn't as they sing, here's what I want you to do. Just slip up and just stand up right where you are. Don't wait. Stand up. Stand up. By faith, stand up. Stand up and say, I need to be accounted amongst the brethren. I want to make a decision for the Lord. Amen. There's a couple here. Others raise their hand. Others raise their hand. Maybe if you're a Christian and you need help and you need encouraged and, and your faith is weak right now, but maybe you would stand and say, I need a touch from God today. Amen. Amen. There's others. Here's what I want you to do if you stood. Just come out of your seat. Christian, slide in the back of your chairs. They're going to sing another worship song. If you just come down this aisle, we'll pray together. We're about done. We're going to close. But we just want to say a quick prayer with a few before they go. Won't you come? Others, won't you come? You raised your hand, and I'll be glad to pray with you. It's not a matter.